One of the most influential theories in the new institutional economics is transaction cost economics, also known as TCE. In this video, I will describe the genesis of the theory. In the next video, I will discuss the basic predictions of the theory for organization of transactions. And in a third video, I will outline its subsequent implications for performance. Let's turn the clock back to 1937. In that year, Ronald Coase published his famous article, The Nature of the Firm. In this article, Coase asked a profound question in two parts. First, if markets are so effective at allocating resources for production, then why do firms even exist? Second, if firms exist because they're actually better than the market at allocating resources, then why isn't the economy organized as one huge firm? Using this thought experiment, Coase proposed that firms and markets differ in their ability to manage economic exchange, and that those activities for which firms provide less costly management will be organized within firms. In those activities, for which markets are less costly, will be managed through markets. Coase's work placed transaction costs at the center of the market hierarchy choice. But although the article was groundbreaking in raising this question and pointed the way to an answer, it was somewhat tautological. If we see a transaction organized within a firm, it must be that it was more efficient that way than organized through the market, and vice versa. Lacking a proposal for operationalizing transaction costs, Coase's work lay dormant for four decades. Fast forward 40 years to the 1970s, and several economists began building on Coase's work to create what would eventually be called the new institutional economics. Oliver Williamson produced perhaps the most prominent incarnation of this, developing his theory of transaction cost economics, or TCE, through a series of articles between the 1970s and the 1990s. Williamson's chief contribution was to overcome the above described tautology. First, Williamson made explicit two behavioral assumptions underlying his theory bounded rationality and opportunism. Why bounded rationality? If rationality were not bounded, that is, if economic actors could costlessly anticipate every future contingency, then actors could write complete contracts covering any potential outcome. Organization doesn't matter in a world where complete contracting is possible. Why opportunism? Meaning that some people have a propensity to seek their own self-interest, sometimes lying, sometimes taking advantage of whatever circumstance arises. In a world without any opportunistic people, Actors could simply agree to work things out as future events unfold. Again, organization plays no role in a world in which all people will honor their promises all the time. But in a world with bounded rationality and opportunism, economic exchange can be hazardous to one's health. Having laid out these behavioral assumptions, Williamson then identified three observable characteristics of any transaction that would affect the relative efficiency of organizing them through the market versus inside the firm. These were asset specificity, uncertainty, and frequency. The most important of these is asset specificity. So what is asset specificity? It's the degree to which an asset is valuable only in a specific use and with a specific exchange partner. Why does this matter? Because if you and I transact and you invest in a highly specific asset to support our transaction, then I can try to renegotiate afterward to get a better deal. Since you've already invested in this asset, you can't easily walk away from our exchange, so you're vulnerable to this renegotiation, which is sometimes called holdup. And of course, since you recognize this risk ahead of time, you might not be willing to make this investment in the first place, precisely because you're not confident that I will keep my side of the bargain afterward. Let me give you a hypothetical example of this. Imagine that I own a furniture factory along the banks of the mighty Mississippi River. I ship my products by barge down the river to New Orleans, where there's huge demand for my furniture for some reason. And imagine that you own a railroad that runs to New Orleans and comes within 50 miles of my factory. Finally, imagine that I would prefer to be able to ship my products by train for some reason. Maybe trains are faster than barges, or more precisely timed, or have lower operating costs, which should translate into lower prices. So I call you and say, why don't you build a rail line from your main track to my factory? I'd love to be your customer. Now, it'll cost you a lot of money to build that track, so you will only do it if you expect to earn a profit that covers both the cost of transporting my products and the cost of building the track. So we negotiate, and I agree to pay you $1,000 per rail car of furniture that you carry. Are you ready to build the track? Not so fast. You might be worried that after you build the track, I will renege on paying $1,000 per carload. I might even have a plausible reason for this. Business isn't as good as I anticipated it would be. My competitors are eating into my profits. My suppliers are gouging me. So I can only afford to pay $800 or $500 or $200 per carload. Now what do you do? 
you wouldn't have built the rail line in the first place if you had known that the price per carload would be 500. But now that it's built, then as long as your variable cost is less than 500, you're better off carrying the load at $500 than saying no. The rail line that you built, well, that's a specific asset. It's valuable in transacting with me, but it has almost zero value outside of our transaction. The difference between first best use and second best use of an asset is sometimes called a quasi-rent. As Williamson pointed out, the existence of quasi-rents creates an incentive for me to haggle with you ex post, in other words, after you've invested, to seek some of that quasi-rent. And this creates an ex ante incentive for you to avoid making specific investments, even in cases where they would generate great efficiency, because you're afraid that I'll renege ex post. Note that if I'm one of many factories in the same location, then you might not be as concerned. If I try to haggle ex post, you can find another customer in my neighborhood and tell me to buzz off. In this case, where there are many potential customers for the same rail line, the difference in value between using the rail line to serve me and using it to serve another customer is close to zero. So there's little quasi-rent, and I have less ex post incentive to haggle, and you have less ex ante reason to be concerned about building this rail line. Put differently, in the case where there are many potential customers in my neighborhood, the rail line has less asset specificity because its value does not depend crucially on my cooperating with you. Uncertainty. Uncertainty exacerbates the problem of asset specificity. One way we might deal with asset specificity would be for you to insist on a long-term contract to guarantee a minimum volume of shipments and a minimum price. But contracts can never be complete, thanks to bounded rationality. In a setting with very low uncertainty, this might not be a problem. For example, imagine that the demand for my product is generally predictable. Maybe because the New Orleans municipal government requires everyone in New Orleans to buy my furniture at a fixed price. And imagine that there is little uncertainty about the availability and cost of inputs for my product. Then the risk of writing a contract that doesn't cover some unforeseen event is relatively small. Not zero, but relatively small. In a world with little uncertainty, you might be comfortable transacting with me even when investing in a highly specific asset. But when uncertainty is high, it's more difficult to anticipate the set of events that might affect the contract. Hence, Higher uncertainty in the presence of asset specificity increases the difficulty of managing our arrangement via a market contract. Finally, if a transaction occurs with greater frequency, then the fixed cost of setting up hierarchical governance, in other words, vertically integrating, can be spread over multiple instances of the transaction, thus making it less costly per occurrence. In recent years, Transaction cost scholars have embraced a fourth dimension of transactions that's particularly relevant to knowledge-based transactions. This is called appropriability. Imagine that in our transaction, I will have to share with you secret information about the construction of my furniture, maybe to help you transport it more effectively. Then I may be concerned that you'll take advantage of this knowledge, perhaps by sharing it with my competitors. In such a case, I might be reluctant to contract with you, as it's difficult to write a contract that will protect my knowledge from all the various ways that it might leak. How might we overcome these contractual hazards? The answer to that appears in the next video on the basic predictions of transaction cost economics.